Welcome to Monday Through Sunday. I'm Logan. I'm Sanam. And I'm Lane. We're best friends, the founders of Blossom Brands, and the hosts of this podcast. We can't wait to take you behind the scenes of running a seven-figure agency with our best friends. We're sharing our mistakes, our lessons learned, and giving you tactical advice to build the career, the business, and the relationships you dream of, and a life you don't need a weekend to escape from. So let's get balanced, and let's get down to business. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Monday through Sunday podcast. We are so excited to be bringing you today's episode because it's about a topic we get asked about all the time, and that is how do you actually start your own business? And no, I'm not talking about the fluffy theoretical junk that they teach you in business school, like doing SWOT analyses and making SMART goals. I'm talking about the actual tactical steps you need to take in order to go from college grad to co-founder. Here with us to dish all the deets are two gals who have done it all. From graduating college and landing their dream job to shortly thereafter realizing that maybe they had a different and much bigger dream, and then actually taking the steps to make all of that happen by starting and scaling a now seven-figure business all by the age of 26 and doing it all with incredible class and style. So I, for one, feel super lucky to have known these two and um, been around them for as long as I have. I feel like I've watched this journey and now get to be a part of this journey, and it's just such a privilege. And knowing these two has completely changed the trajectory of my life for the better, and my hope is that today's episode will do the same for our listeners. So without further ado, Lane and Sanam, the co-founders of Blossom Brands and my partners in all things life and business, how are we doing today? Hi, that was a really nice intro, Logan. That was so cute. And it got me so excited to talk about this because honestly, if I think about like why we're doing this, why we're launching a podcast, like my full complete motivation behind it, it is for people to be able to like make this life transition. Um, because when I think back to working in corporate America, not it's not this way for everyone, but for me, like I was in my most anxious state and like, I feel like I'm just thriving in every aspect of my life so much more. And people put up all these hurdles around starting a business. Like, how do you get insurance? How do you do all these things? And I think if you can break down those barriers, it's really not that like challenging of a thing to do. Obviously it takes so much motivation, so much dedication and a lot of planning. Um, You need the right support around you, but it's possible. And I really, really am so inspired to help people be able to do the same. So that just got me so excited. Thank you, Logan. Of course. I totally agree. I think that's so the message of this podcast. It's not as hard as you think. And it is hard if you don't know what to do. So what that's what we're here for. And especially today's episode is to tell you exactly what to do so you can do it for yourself. So um, before we get into today's topic, um, I want to dive into our personal and professional best. So for those of you who are new here, just started listening to the podcast, first of all, welcome. We're so glad you're here. But um, for this segment, this is where we dive into our wins of the week so that we can celebrate what went right and hold each other accountable for the things that we want to do better. So Lane and Sanam, do either of you have either a personal best or professional best that you want to share from this past week? I have a personal best. Okay. And I am so happy about it because it's something that I just really needed for myself. So I recently got into the biggest book slump, which was honestly so tough because I love reading. I love listening to books. And I started reading this book. I don't know why. Emily Henry books. People are obsessed with her books. She's like the writer of Beach Read, Book Lovers, People We Meet on Vacation, like those types of books. I've read two now and both have gotten me in a book slump. So I think I just need to part ways with her as an author for now. I was recently in Nantucket and I picked up an Ellen Hildebrand book. She is a Nantucket-based author and I met her at a book signing. So I was like, oh, I need to buy a physical book. I'm a Kindle girly. I was debating between two books and this beautiful woman in front of me named Heather, she recommended I pick up Golden Girls. So I was like, okay, I'm going to pick it up. Started it on the beach when I went to Cape Cod thereafter. And literally, I am never a morning person or an afternoon reader. I'm always a night reader. And this morning I was like so close to finishing it. I got up 6.30, read in bed for like an hour. And I I only have 40 pages left, but we had to record this podcast and I'm so excited to finish it after. (laughs) And now I'm back in my, like my book, like routine. And so I already picked my next book from the library, just send it to my Kindle. And I'm just, if you can't tell by my enthusiasm, getting back into reading after taking probably a two and a half month hiatus because of Happy Place from Emily Henry. We're back. 
we're feeling good. Oh, oh my gosh, I you. love that. I'm also honored that you were able to put down the book with 40 pages to go just to talk to us because that is I actually know. the hardest thing to do. It's like almost 40, 400 pages and I had 40 left and I'm just like, I'm so close to figuring out what happens. Mm-hmm. And, but it's okay. I like have something to look forward to today as Lane would call it a glimmer. Yes. And so I am just really, really happy. We love this for you. I'm also in my book girly era right now. Um, I am... I feel like you, Saddam. I'm listening to a, an audiobook. I'm reading a physical book, and I'm reading a Kindle book. Like, Wait! Oh time. wow! The trifecta. literally, you are. This is not you. This is not your character. I know. I'm so confused. It really is like a whole new chapter for me, and I'm thriving in it. I think. Pun are you reading mom books? Or are you reading fiction books? What are we reading? I'm reading a diverse amount of books because that's what my therapist and I decided that was best for me. Right now and I shouldn't put all my eggs in one basket in terms of the content I'm exposing myself to. I don't so recognize you. I'm listening to an audiobook that's about spirituality. I am reading a book that is like a mom book and on my Kindle I'm reading a book about um about birth plans. So kind of a wow. lot of mom and spirituality books right now for me. We love this for Lee and Catherine. <laughs> I love this. My Goodreads feeds will finally have something besides Sanam's updates. So I'll have Lane's updates too. I've been, I've been trying to actually like keep tabs on my on my. Yeah, Logan, I don't know if I've you checked your app recently, but like Lane has been like low I know. Key, like updating things like every day. I know. I've seen. And I finished a book yesterday, guys. Um, That book I was reading, Simple Path to Wealth. I just finished it either yesterday or the day before. So well, look at us. We're such reader reading girlies right now. I know. I love this energy. Logan, do you have a personal or professional best this week? Oh, I actually do. And Sanam, I didn't hear your best beforehand, but I'm really glad that you had the one that you had because I think it ties into the theme of mine because I feel like you've kind of gotten back into the saddle to use the Texas expression of like getting back into reading. And my personal best is also in the theme of getting Getting back on the horse. I feel like honestly, this year, like 2023, I've been just sort of like to be completely transparent in like a little bit of a mental funk for no apparent reason. Like our business is great, my personal relationships are thriving, but for whatever reason, I've just been like struggling with just some underlying feelings of like unhappiness, lack of confidence, like self love, things like that. And it really makes no actual sense because all of 2022, I was like at my best place with those types of feelings. And there's no reason I should be feeling the way that I have been in 2023. And I've tried so many things to kind of just like nip that in the bud and just like haven't been successful. But I feel like this week and maybe the past week and a half, I finally gotten back in the saddle and um, I found some things that are starting to kind of turn the tides on that. And I'm just feeling a little bit more like myself, a little bit more at peace. And I've been trying, trust me, I've been trying to feel that way. Um, But it's finally actually just in small areas happening again. So I'm feeling more optimistic, a little more zest for life and you know, just keeping it real because sometimes that happens. Yeah, sometimes it's like what's going on in the universe and mm-hmm. um, the astrology of it all in my in my perspective. So give yourself some grace and know that sometimes it's just out of your control. Logan, all I have to say is I hope that you're like celebrating the moments when you feel this way because moments are fleeting and it's like so important to like take the time to be like, wow, I feel so good and just like enjoy it, relish in it. And so I'm so happy to hear that you're having a great week and hopefully it sets the tone for a great month. Thanks. I will say, Sanam, I took one of your tips and I this may, I'm not saying correlation or I'm saying correlation, maybe not causation, maybe both, who knows, but I have been treating myself to more matchas lately. Just a little glimmer in my day. I've we been love. hitting up all the local coffee shops and probably spending a little bit too much on $7 lattes, but honestly they have sparked joy and have been that little moment of relishing joy. So we'll take it. Um, okay. So should we go ahead and get into it guys? I think Let's we should. It. So as I mentioned, today's episode is all about The tips that you need to know, things you need to do either before starting a business, while starting a business, or actually after you've started it. And um, this is like baseline, square one. Starting a business is something that you either like kind of have it on your heart or you don't, or it could evolve over time. But I do think like if you feel that tug, if you feel that inkling that like starting a business is something that you would be interested in, whether or not you feel like it's feasible, 
It's um, like in the cards for you. You know, you can think of all the reasons like why you shouldn't. Wherever you may be in your journey and in the process, we just wanna make it really easy for you to know, okay, you wanna start a business, now what? Here are the eight things you need to do to get up and running and turn it into hopefully one day a really successful business. So without further ado, tip number one is to set yourself up for success financially, mentally, and physically. So Lane, would you like to tell the people what that um, entails? Yes. Okay. So this one I think is so important and something that people might not always talk about. Even if you are not ready to start a business, you can start laying the foundation for this now um, to get yourself really in a position that when you are ready to take the jump, like you have done the um, the work, you've done the baseline uh, that you need in order to jump in. So first, financially saving. This is so important. You are very likely going to lose your income for a while. Um, So for us, it was important. We said, okay, let's have at least six months of savings, of living expenses in our bank account that we feel comfortable if we made no money for six months, we would be completely fine. So how do we do that? Go look at your bank statements. Go look at your credit card bills. Look at where you're spending money. Find areas that you can cut and be like, okay, I can be frugal and not spend money in these areas, but these are the essentials. Figure out what that number comes out to. Add in maybe a little bit of um, buffer room for things that come up that you're not expecting um, and make sure you have at least six months. You know, if you think, oh, for this type of business, I might need more, that's fine. But for us, we said six months. Um, Then have a healthy lifestyle and routine. So your fitness routine, um, are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating healthy? These are things that like when you start experiencing a lot of stress can be the first things that you just kind of um, let out the Mm -hmm. door and you don't prioritize. So I would say right now, before you start a business, like Whatever it looks like for you, I'd say get like that completely squared away and stick to it. Also consider talk therapy. I think that it's such a big mental transition. Um, And I think having like an outlet where you're just like processing your thoughts can be really, really beneficial and helpful. So I know it's not for everyone. Whatever it looks like for you, I would say fitness, but also try meditation, try talk therapy, push yourself in ways that feel uncomfortable. I'd say when you find resistant points, like that is an opportunity to dive in. Um, So whatever those things are, challenge yourself um, because starting a business has a lot of challenges, a lot of resistance points. So test it with some things that could really set you up to be in a better position. Meditation, therapy were not things on my list at the time of starting a business. I think that it would have been very helpful if I had those practices in place. So I would definitely recommend them. And lastly, this is one I just kind of threw in here um, this morning thinking about it is filter your content um, intake and the people you surround yourself with. I think especially like when you start a business, you'll get a little bit of critique from people around you. Like, oh, are you sure that's what you want to do? You'll get a lot of doubt from other people, but you'll also find people that really, really build you up. So I would say find the people that build you up and spend time with them. Find the type of content in terms of podcasts and books that inspires you and stick to that and try to filter out the rest. Lord knows how much that we got. Such, such good tips. Um, So I want to ask you a couple questions about that. So in terms of setting yourself up financially, I love the tip about making sure that you have six months living expenses. But my question for you is saying that you want to save six months of expenses is a lot different than actually doing it, like actually having the willpower to follow through. So I want to know, is this something that you've always been good at like managing personal finances before even considering business finances? Like where did you like learn how to be good with money and actually follow through on saving that initial six months of expenses? That's a great question. I would say the biggest thing for me, um, cause we started this business early. We were 26 years old. I was not far out of college, but my first year and a half after college, I lived at home. Um, okay. I saved so much during that year and a half, um, of my life. Like I think I put Um, Just to be completely transparent, like $20,000 into my bank account in savings that year and a half. And I was making nothing. Like I I just didn't, my parents were feeding me. I didn't pay rent and I just didn't have many expenses at all. So um, that was like crucial. It made just 
that transition, it ga- I already had that comfort that I had built up um, from a couple years prior because then once I moved out and was living on my own, I wasn't saving very much money. And like, um, like I just want to like go back and emphasize the fact that like you were making a very bare minimum starting salary during that time. So to save that much is mm-hmm. a very big deal. Thank you. And mm-hmm. as a unique opportunity time-wise, like there's not many times in your life you could completely just nix all living expenses and go like stay with your parents or another loved one. Like it's really, I think, a unique time frame that more people fresh out of college should probably consider taking advantage of if they can muster it for a year or so. Okay, awesome. So we've got our minds right. We've got our money right. We've got our body right. Now we need to actually like learn something that we can sell and make money off of, right? So tip number two is master a marketable skill. And Sanam, can you tell us about that? Yes. So for Lynn and I, at the time, it was very clear what our path was, but it took a little bit of navigating to figure out that we actually wanted to take that path. Initially, we were just like, okay, we want to start a business. And so we had all these wacky, crazy ideas. I like vividly remember us sitting in Lane's <laughs> apartment and like telling her then boyfriend, like, what do you think of this idea? And then he would just like look at us like, I mean, and just like try to be supportive, but like they were just not sound ideas. And we then, like wanted to launch a product. We were like, I was yeah, about to ask, what was an idea? <laughs> oh, we had like thought of this idea Some about this like thing. hair cap to like preserve <laughs> a blowout. Um, you know, we just went through all the different avenues. And then one time I had gone to San Francisco to visit clients. So I remember I went to my family's house. It was my mom and my brother. And I was so burnt out, so tired. And I was like, Lena and I were just thinking about like X, Y, Z that we want to do. And then my brother sat me down and he was like, why do you, why do you want to do that? Like you guys literally like do digital marketing for very big clients. You have very, you're very talented. You have a lot of skills to be able to leverage. And I looked at him and I was like, you are crazy. There is absolutely no way we want to do this. We're so tired of this. We're so burnt out. And he's like, listen, you're burnt out because you're doing this for someone else on someone else's terms. When you do it for yourself, it's completely different. You're doing everything on your own terms and you're building the life and the business that you want for yourself. I guarantee you, you'll be so happy if you take this route. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And then I texted Lane and then we went to Flower Child in Dallas like the day after I got back and we talked about it and we're like, I guess this makes sense. So then from (laughs) that day, we decided to make that our plan. And so that's how we like got started marketing, doing digital marketing based off those conversations that we had. Then Lane individually went and spoke to her family. I talked to mine and then we came together. We decided to move forward. But mastering a marketable skill, there are so many things that you can do. There are so many things that you can learn. You don't necessarily have to already have the knowledge base to be able to launch a business with a service. You can learn any new skill. I've seen people do it on TikTok all the time of like, learning new skills on TikTok, on YouTube, on platforms like Skillshare. There are so many resources out there. Like think of like copywriting, SEO, um, like leveraging AI in your business, personal assistance, virtual assistants, email marketing. Email marketing, marketing, SMS marketing, UGC creators. Those are ones in our field that we see Mm -hmm. need for all the time. And like you don't need to have a lot of experience. All you need to do, which I'll get into it later, is be able to get the first few clients that will be your test guinea pig clients where you're kind of learning and kind of going off of. And then from there, being able to take those case studies and then market it and gradually build up your portfolio to be able to bill according to your skill level. One thing I want to call out about what Sanam just said and just like reemphasize is if you're in a job right now that you're like, oh, I don't want to be going down this path anymore. This isn't for me. Uh, Make sure you try to separate because honestly, I don't know if we would if or when we would have taken the jump to do this in like a digital marketing capacity without that push from your brother. Um, But so I would say separate the skill you are doing from the environment it's happening in. Because a lot of times you might associate like being unhappy or being uninspired with what skill or what industry you're in when maybe it is more of a result of the company you're at, the people you're surrounding yourself with. Um, and maybe that skill could be applied in a way that would make you way happier if you were doing it on your own terms. So just something to think about. My brothers have a business for legal funding in the personal injury world. And just something tells me they don't wake up every day so excited to dive into legal funding. But again, it's about 
like being able to have your own business and Mm -hmm. all of like the stimulation that comes with like setting up the infrastructure of a business, growing a business. Like there's so many exciting facets of a business that isn't just tied to the direct subject of like what you're marketing. I agree completely. And I will say as someone who's made the jump a little bit more recently within the last two years or so, when your effort is directly correlated with your income, it makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. That's just really, for me at least, is just a huge factor because you're just, you're directly reaping the benefits of all of your hard work. Recognizing what you're good at also is really important. Like a lot of times um, you're in a job and you're like, yeah, I'm like doing well. I get good performance reviews, but where are your actual skills lie and like acknowledging those. So even if you're not feeling inspired by a job, you can take certain components of that job and be like, okay, well, I'm really good at copywriting. I'm really Mm -hmm. good at coming up with new ideas. Maybe I don't love to build ad previews all day, but I do love components of this. So how do I build on the components that I love and craft the way I do things based on the things that I love and the things that are going to make me the most money. Cause that's at least like where I found happiness. That's a really good tip and good point, um, to make because, you know, we, most people when they're working in a corporate environment are doing a lot of different things. So maybe take a second to recognize when something sparks joy and write it down. Something Mm -hmm. in your day that you're working on that you get excited. Or if you have a list of things, what do you naturally go to first versus the things you wait to the end of your list to do? Like, where do you want to be spending your time and think through how you can expand on that? That's a great point. We always say that in our day to day. We're like, my brain really wants to work on this right now. (laughs) And you'll push everything to the side. Like Lane said, procrastinate all the rest, but your brain really wants to do that task. I would take note of that task exactly like Lane said, and see how you can build around it. So we've mastered our skill. Moving on to tip number three, and that is pick your name and own it everywhere. So this is deciding what you want your company to be called, which I feel like is can sound like the simplest task, but it's often the hardest one. So I want to know, Lane, who of you came up with the name Blossom Brands and how'd you come up with it? So how we came up with it, I really don't know, but I do remember that I came up with it journaling, writing random words down in a notebook and writing down different um, iterations of them, taking out certain letters, adding certain letters, just like whatever came to my mind. And at one point I just wrote down Blossom, B-L-O-S-M. And I was like, kind of like that and just kind of tabled it. And then Sanam came over. We were sitting on the rooftop of my apartment at the time and we were just like, talking, brainstorming, throwing words around. And I said that one and we were both kind of like, that tracks, like that sounds good. And we were like, Blossom, it's about flourishing. It's about, you know, um, becoming the best version of yourself. Like it it has all these meanings. It's just an inspiring word. And we just kind of decided, we were like, let's just roll with it. We, at no point were we like, oh, this is right. We were just like, we got to come up with a name to take the next step. So let's stick with this one. (laughs) And we came up with some weird names. (laughs) I don't even remember at like any of them besides that one, honestly. Same. Well, honestly, it looks good on paper, which is so important. And not to mention we're a growth marketing agency. So the growth component is something we carry with us to this day. So I love that. But I do want to mention before Lane continues is that one thing that I wish that we had done was like Google search the name because there was this marketing company called Just Blossom, not Blossom Brands. And so there was a period when I was telling people the name of our company, they would just go to Blossom.com and they would like see all of this, all these things that just weren't representative of us. I don't know if it, ex- I think that they no longer exist anymore, but it took a while for us to show up first in SEO because of that company, despite us thinking that we had unique spelling. So always research it and make sure. That's a good call out. So I think that segues perfectly to my next question, which is, so you've picked your name. Now, what do you do? Like, what do you do about it? How do you make sure you own it? So like Sanam was saying that your business doesn't get confused with other people's. A hundred percent. So this was, um, I would say, Sanam really excels in this area of like figuring out how you do things. How do you own something everywhere? Um, So for us, that was purchasing our URL. We did so on Namecheap, but I would recommend either Squarespace or Shopify. If you are launching an e-commerce business where you're going to sell products, I think Shopify is for sure the preferred um, route there. But Squarespace is what we use. And it's a really easy way to set up a website that 
without having any background in coding or design or web development that you can build a website. Not that ours was good by any means at that point. Couldn't even tell you what it looked like. Don't yeah, remember. I don't remember either. But anyway, so own it, buy your URL, build a website. Once you own the URL, create your Google workspace. So this is where you can then set up your Gmail accounts that are like for our instance at blossombrands.com, um, your Google Drive, your Google Calendar. So all your Google entities, I'd say get those set up um, as a next step and then make sure you own all of the social handles. Even if you don't think you're going to use YouTube or Pinterest, whatever it is, just go ahead and reserve the names of your business in case things change in the future. So Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, go ahead and set up your accounts. Um, so you just own that real estate in the digital space. So important. Totally agree. And we just went through a similar process for our podcast. And I will say like, we're not using everything we set up, but just to know that we have it gives me such peace of mind. And um, this is an optional step I would add here, but you can also, if your name is something like a colloquial phrase that's commonly used, you can also um, get a trademark for it, which kind of leads us into our next topic, which are all of the unsexy parts of starting a business. So all the tax logistics, um, setting up an LLC, anything else you need to do legally besides a trademark. So Sinam, I know you fully owned that process for Blossom. So can you talk us through kind of like what are the key things you need to make sure you do at that phase? Yes. And I will say I had no idea what to do until my brother sent us the most lengthy email telling us step by step what we needed to do. So um, first step was to file for your business entity with the IRS. So that's either LLC, S Corp, Partnership, um, corporation, you have to research them to see what makes the most sense for your business. But I would say the most common route that people take is the LLC route. Next is applying for your EIN number. So you do this after you like file for your business entity. So your EIN number, which is called your employer identification number, is essentially the social security number for your business. So that is the information that you give the government, other companies that you're working with. This is your government ID, essentially. And so you have to do this after you file for your business entity name, just because the form for, on your EIM form will ask for your business name. So you can either just download the paperwork from the IRS website and mail it in, which is what we did, but we did it under the guidance of a lawyer at the time. But there are resources out there like LegalZoom where they allow you to, pray, to pay a price and they kind of essentially walk you through the process, handhold you through it. And I would say if we didn't have um, the help of a lawyer at the time, that's the route that we would have taken just because it it's so uncertain. It just makes it so clear to use. And so um, our, the lawyer that we worked with was a personal connection, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, so make sure for these types of things, like reach out to personal networks, like see, see what resources you have that you don't know you have based off talking to your parents, your neighbors, your, um, your sisters, your brothers, their roommates, just ask people because you never know who you might know that might be able to help. For sure. Good That's point. super important. And so what I want to know, all of these things, like were these things that you did right away or did, like as soon as you decided to start the business, you owned the name and then proceeded with these things? Or did you already have clients and like money coming in? And like, were you like an actual living business at this point? Or you did all these things beforehand? And which of those two routes would you recommend to the audience? We did this all ahead of time. So we didn't okay. pursue any clients. We didn't have any income coming in. We wanted to make sure all of the logistics were set up. So basically from the day we decided to the day that we gave notice, which was four weeks, we set up all the foundation. Then once the foundation was set up, that's when we kind of started allowing people to let their friends know, their networks know that we are open, willing to take clients, so on and so forth. But it's really important to get everything squared away just because it'll make your taxes a lot easier come the end of the year, come tax season. Okay. That's good to know. And I think it also is indicative of like your confidence at the time. Like when you're going through the effort to file all this paperwork, it like proves to yourself that you're taking yourself and this business seriously, even though it's in the early stages. So I think that's just really the right mentality to start things with. Oh my God. Throwback to when Lane and I got to the WeWork office of our prior job an hour early, printed the paperwork there, filled it out, signed it, and then literally went into the office with the paperwork in our envelope and just got, went on with our day. Like everything was normal. It was, and it was we were quite a time. So, I remember being like something happened that we were like, oh my gosh, is there any way that it printed another copy and it's still sitting there on the printer? Like I remember like something happening and us being yep. so scared that it was like on the printer and someone was going to see our name on it. 
<laughs> like, oh, oh they're God. just starting an LLC partnership under Sanam Ganin and Lane Lipo just at the office while totally working a normal job. That was just a very stressful time. I think what you said, Logan, about that kind of just being a confidence booster of like, I believe that I can do this is a really good point. Um, and something I really hadn't thought about, but a lot of people might be like, oh, I don't need to file for these things until I actually start making money. But if you want to believe that you're going to be successful and if you want to believe that like you can do it, take those steps, give yourself the confidence that it's going to work. You're just setting the foundation for yourself to be in like coming from a place of being ahead of the game versus like playing catch up. Very true. Good Super point. important. Okay. So you have your logistics set up. You're a living, breathing business, at least in the <laughs> eyes of the government. And I want to dive back a little bit into the people in your life. I know Lane mentioned something earlier about like keeping an eye on who's in your circle. Sanam's talked a lot about her brother and how he was a huge mentor for you guys. So tip number five is find a mentor. And what I want to ask you is, first of all, did you growing up have this idea of entrepreneurship as like something that was discussed in your family. Um, I know we discussed um, Sanam's brother and both of her brothers actually are entrepreneurs. So was this a topic that was commonly discussed growing up? And like, did you see that as like a viable career path or more of a pipe dream? I would say that we had very clear mentors um, for us throughout this process. So as we've talked about Sanam's brothers, um, one of her brothers in particular really, really helped us um, pave the path for starting our business. And then my parents were both entrepreneurs. And I would say both my mom and my dad have been very supportive and mentored us in different ways. And I think without the assistance and the confidence and um, the support of people in our family and people that we trusted and knew were like going to guide us on the right path, we would have been starting from a much more challenging place. So I would mm -hmm. definitely encourage anyone that is interested in this to find mentors. Just overall, it's going to be someone that will give you a fresh perspective and can um, potentially assist with networking. Um, but then also, I think having someone that can kind of challenge you and ask you questions that you might not um, feel comfortable asking yourself, like some of those resistant points, um, about what are your long-term goals? Have you thought about this? Like that you might kind of have in the back of your head, but like you don't let yourself go there. Finding people that can push you in that way, I think is so important, especially when you're not in a career environment with a boss and with, um, you know, your annual review, like you don't have that set up. So finding people that can be those resources, I think is so important, whether it be people in our, um, instance that are entrepreneurs, um, and that have been through this process before, or people that, you know, you are inspired by their career in some way, shape or form. I think that it's really, really important. Um, but going back to your question about like, did we grow up around entrepreneurs? Both of us come from families. My parents started a business. Sanam's brothers started a business. Um, so I was definitely exposed to that. If you would have asked me if I planned to start a business or if I thought I would, I would have said no. I thought that I would like climb the corporate ladder and work for brands, work for agencies. But I don't think unless Sanam had said like, we should just start our own business. We should do this. Like, I just don't think I believed in myself enough. I think maybe over the years with other work, I would have gotten to the point where I would have believed in myself enough. But like on my own at that young, that age, 26 years old, like I was not like feeling myself thinking I can do this. Like it, that's not who I was, but I was definitely exposed to it. And I think that a hundred percent put us, um, ahead of a lot of people that might consider doing this because it was a part of um, our childhood and our upbringing. Yeah, I would agree with that because both my parents were also entrepreneurs. So in our family, it was just very normal conversation to like talk about how all of us would start businesses one day. So when my brothers did it, it was just kind of an expectation. In high school, I did a summer program at USC for entrepreneurship specifically. So I just feel like it was kind of like always in my blood. And every time I was in like student government or whatever in high school, I treated it as a business. So for me, it was something that was like, I know I'm going to this one day. I don't know what it looks like, but eventually I will. And then once I connect it with Lane, I feel like, okay, this is like who I know I want to do it with. And then it just blossomed from there. And if you're like, I, I would love to find a mentor. I don't know how to, or, um, they're not going to care. Why would they want to help me? Um, I would say that you should try if you, I can identify some people that might be good mentors for you. Um, try to ask yourself, like, what 
is what could be in it for them? Like, what could I offer them in exchange? Um, so whether it's something they can invest in your business or um, they, you can offer them some type of service in return. So do you do social media? Can you help them with their social media? I like that. I think the part about making sure that it's like a give a little, get a little is yeah. really what makes all the difference. Cause I think not a lot of people are thinking about that. Like realistically, like humans are selfish. So we're thinking, yeah, I want a mentor cause it's going to help me. But going that extra mile to think about how you can help them is not only going to make you a more attractive mentee, but it's also just a good mindset to have in business in general. Exactly. I totally agree. Awesome. So moving right along, tip number six, and this is setting up your financial logistics. So Sanam, the same question as we talked about earlier with the tax and legal things. What about the business money, the bank accounts, the credit cards? How did you know what to do with all of that? What did you do with all of that? And is there anything that you would recommend that our listeners either do or don't do? Okay. So after you have your business entity filed and you have your EIN number, that's when you can open the bank account. And so we would recommend opening a bank account with a bank that you have access to locally. So especially now that Lane and I live in separate states, whenever we're accessing the bank account, we can both go to the bank and kind of do whatever we need to do. And it's not always on one person. So that's one thing that really helps us. And we use Chase and they've been a, a great bank. If you do have them locally, it's definitely one we'd recommend. For sure. Then it's about opening your credit cards. So based off my brother's recommendation, we opened up a Capital One Spark card, which is honestly the best. It's 2% cash back on every purchase. It's a great credit card for any business size. I know businesses that are 10 times bigger than ours that use it and way smaller than ours that use it. It's an excellent card. Highly would recommend that. Um, and overall, in terms of your general accounting, we recommend using QuickBooks. It is the crowd pleaser across every business. It's basically like the Shopify stamp of approval, but for accounting. It is an excellent resource. It just makes managing your finances extremely easy in terms of invoicing your clients if you ever take that step. But Lane manages our QuickBooks accounts to a T. Everything is so detailed, so organized, and it just makes it easy. So when I jump in and I'm not working on things like she is, I'm still able to have an understanding of what's happening based off the layout of how QuickBooks kind of organizes and presents your information. And one thing I want to say about the credit card, especially when you're getting started and you have some initial expenses um, with the 2% cash back you can just redeem purchases so it can lower your expenses if you're if you do have a business that does have high expenses luckily we um digital marketing like we needed some technology softwares and um, our computers and things like that. But overall, it's a pretty low overhead. But if you're doing something that has high overhead, um, you can just like almost erase purchases to lower your expenses versus like, you know, a lot of credit cards, it's travel rewards, things like that. Um, I would say from a business perspective, it's really nice at the beginning to be able to just like uh, erase some of your expenses to lower those um, initial expenses. I think that's a really good call out because it can be really compelling to want to do a travel rewards card. So you're like, oh, I booked this fight on points for free. But I think when you're just starting off being really lean and very frugal with your business cash flow is super critical. So having that opportunity to just offset your expenses slightly, I think is super worth it. And the straightforward nature of 2% cash back on everything. You don't have to monitor categories. That's something mm -hmm. that I've been getting a little bit more into like credit card hacking recently. And Sanam is like the queen of this. We'll have to do a whole other episode about it. But for yeah. me personally, I thought I was going to be like that. And I did all the research. I learned everything. But then I realized I just like don't want to put in the effort to transfer points and find the deals. So I will say like, just from like my own, like personal finance perspective, the more you can simplify, um, the better off you'll be in the long term because it's something that you'll be better able to maintain. Before we go into our next topic, I do quickly would like Lane to explain in one sentence, like what expensing means and how that ties into your taxes. Yeah, sure. So, okay. Um, expensing something means that it is within a category that you can write it off on your taxes. So if you are buying a computer that you are going to use for your business, you'd put it on a business credit card. And then at the end of the year, it goes into the amount of money that you can subtract from what you owe taxes on. So if you fall within the 20%, 20 to 30% um, tax bracket, um, you will end up paying 20 to 30% less on that computer because that amount doesn't have to also go into what you end up paying taxes on. 
Is, does Excellent that make sense? explanation. Was that clear? Yes. Okay, Wait, cool. you mean so writing something off doesn't make it free? <laughs> <laughs> I wish that were the case. No, that's a serious question because I do think that's a common misconception. So your frame of reference is you can think of it in your head. It makes it like 20 to 30% less. Yeah. To an extent, it can make it free for you if you put it on your business and you are not putting it on what you are personally making. So yes, if I buy something on my business, I'm not buying it on my personal account. It is then free for me. But not free for the business. But not free for the business. <laughs> yes. And I think that's a very important <laughs> note because a lot of people think it means like free it free and clear. And so just think about that the next time you're trying to write off your Goyard because you use it to carry your laptop <laughs> from your bed to your couch. We did make a TikTok about this. We did. Ago. That's exactly yes. what I was referencing. <laughs> <laughs> One other topic in terms of logistics is insurance. I have heard that the most common point of friction that people encounter or reason why people don't start that business that they have it on their heart that they want to start is concerns about insurance, which personally that just like kills me because mm -hmm. insurance, yes, it's important. Yes. You need it for stability for if God forbid the worst were to happen and you were to have unexpected medical expenses, like don't get me wrong. Insurance is so important, but the upside of pursuing a business with so much revenue potential and so much passion that you feel cannot be squashed by the simple matter of insurance. So Lane, can you tell us how the people can set up insurance, make sure they can live happy and healthy lives, but also pursue their passions? Yes. And I can talk about this at length because insurance is something that for me was a, like you just said, it was a hot topic. It was something I was really concerned about because I do have some really expensive um, medications that is really important that my insurance covers. And so at this point when we were like, okay, we want to start a business. I was like, how am I going to get insurance? How am I going to get a good insurance? Um, and for me, what I was able to do is pursue something called Cobra. I would recommend anyone that currently has a full-time job, if you are considering leaving it to start um, your own business, look into Cobra. It is a way that for normally up to two years, you can use the your previous employer's plan. So I was able to stay on my insurance plan for two years. I just had to pay for it. It is a big expense, but I can still use that plan because what everybody gets hung up on is, okay, I don't have access to these strong plans if I don't have an employer that can provide me a PPO. So that was a saving grace for me because I have two years to figure out what I need to do next. Um, so I would definitely recommend looking into that. Then make sure that when you're accounting for how much you need for six months of living expenses, insurance is one of those expenses now. Um, so whether it's two to $300 or five to $600 based off of what type of plan that you have. Mine is a little bit more expensive, um, but I just know that that's one of my living expenses. Um, whereas Sanam went um, a different route when we took this leap. She went through an independent marketplace. So anybody can just get insurance. You just can't get that great of a plan. You can't get a PPO plan, I think is what um, the differentiator is. Um, so Sanam, what was your experience with um, the independent marketplace route with insurance? I can't remember if I did it through a person you or found if I went. Yeah. His name was David. And um, <laughs> David of all names. It's like David sells insurance. <laughs> Give me your money. I met him on Bumble Biz. Oh and my god. Wait, are you serious? No, legitimately. Like I was swiping on Bumble Biz cuz like I was we'll get into it in our next topic, but like I was trying to put our name out there. And so I met David on Bumble Biz and then he kind of helped me like set up an insurance plan through I don't know what I don't remember <laughs> what it was called. But you can get an, I did an independent um marketplace plan, I would say just Google that. You can figure it out or get on Upwork and um, look for someone that offers those services. I think it's li literally free to work with them. They just get a kickback from um, like the plan or something. So look into that. And then I would say what we are doing now that we couldn't do at that point because we now have more than two full-time employees, 
we qualify for having a small business insurance plan so we can all have access to PPOs. Yes, we pay for it. The business pays for it. Um, but if you have two W-2 employees, you can, at least in Texas, get a small business broker plan or something of that nature. Um, so those okay. are my tips on insurance. And then also, if you are married, I'm sure you know this, but you can get on your husband or wife or spouse's plan as well. So that's another um, thing if you are planning on getting married or you are married that you can use their plans too. Use that as leverage to get the rock if needed. <laughs> <laughs> Babe, I just want to save on insurance. Marry me, please. <laughs> so that is all about insurance. So our last and final tip is number eight, which is arguably maybe the most important because you've done all this work, you need to get paid somehow. And so tip number eight is how to get your first clients. Okay. So to get your first clients, you need to spam your name everywhere. Everyone in your network needs to know what you do. This is not a time to be shy. This is arguably the time where it's the most cringe because you're kind of like letting everyone know I did this new thing. I still remember the day Lane and I posted on LinkedIn. It was incredibly uncomfortable. I made her post it first so then I could repost her. So it wasn't as like intense from my side. It's just a very scary time, but it's also the most exciting. So Lane and I were putting ourselves out there everywhere. We landed our first client, which was her stepdad. But in terms of like new clients that weren't personal network connections, we would apply to anything and everything on Upwork. We are scouring every new post. If there was a new post, we would always see it within a matter of like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and so we got several clients through that. Probably our first like three years of clients we got through Upwork. But our very first client, I will never forget, was an industry that was not related to what we do. We do a lot of beauty, fashion, luxury. This was like a website that was educating women about like breastfeeding, but we signed them on for $300 a month. And for context, we sign clients up to like $10,000 a month minimum. It depends, but it's it, we have to start from somewhere. It's really important to start anywhere. And for us, even though we knew that was way below what we'd ever want to sign a client for, Lane and I gave each other a high five. My brother sent us this email. Congratulations. You signed on your first client because it is a first client and it's worth celebrating that someone else that doesn't know you, doesn't have any personal ties to you, trusted your business to help their business. And then we ended up working with this client for well over a year. And then she left and then she came back. And so you just never know who you can be introduced to, but it all has to start somewhere. So websites like Upwork, Fiverr, Indeed, there are many types of resources out there where people find like one-off contract help and contract help that can turn into long-term help, but don't be shy in putting your name out there. I think those are great tips. And I would just add like your ability to just be scrappy during that time frame. Like at this point, like you've put all your eggs in this basket and like you need to see it through to success. And so doing what you need to do to keep the thing afloat is so important. And I think the willingness to do that, it shows so much initiative, so much drive, and just like the raw will to succeed. Because also at that time, like you're still learning. So there's a time to land your dream client and raise your rates and all those things. But I would argue you don't want to do that right off the bat because you're still learning. So when we did start landing dream clients years down the line, we were at the top of our game. A hundred percent. And I would say at the beginning, don't say no to opportunities. Like you never know what you are going to learn from it. And I think that um, that was something that we knew a lot of these opportunities were not what we wanted to be doing. They weren't the types of clients we wanted to work with. They weren't the type of money we wanted to be making from each project. But we were like, well, why not? We don't have anything else that is eating up our time right now. We don't have other clients to work on. Let's give it a try and see how it goes. And I think then from there, we were able to, instead of saying no up front, we were able to um, figure out what worked and cut ties once we realized it wasn't serving us anymore. And we've already learned the lesson from it. So I think um, one of the big uh, challenges in the beginning was learning when something was no longer working um, for us or serving us. Um, we very early recognized that a number one deciding factor about the jobs we take on are who the people are on the other side that we are working with and um, are they respecting us? Do we feel like we have good synergy with them? And when we felt like that line had been crossed, we decided like we're not 
go, we're going to part ways from these types of people. And that was really challenging at first. I remember, um, you know, the first person that we decided like, okay, they're paying us $2,000 a month and we no longer want to work with them, even though we weren't making a bunch of money, but we were like, this is not worth the energy that is draining from us. And I think learning those types of lessons was so crucial up front because now we are so selective. You, like the three of us are so selective about who we work with, um, what type of businesses, what type of people, um, what energy we get from the type of work that we're doing. And while yes, the very beginning isn't the time to be, you know, having up the, or having those types of um, boundaries and walls up about the work that you take. It will teach you things to be able to make those decisions in the future. I feel like that was the perfect takeaway to kind of close our conversation, Lane. I feel like what you just said about um, learning when to fire clients and learning like what your boundaries are as business owners. That can be an entire follow-up episode. There was so much ground we covered just in these eight tips. So I wanna make sure we put a fine point on that. We don't go any further because I really want to. You guys will have to send us a DM or an email to let us know what you wanna hear more about next, whether it's firing clients, whether it's how to, like what do you include in contracts, making your, hiring your first employees, how to start scaling your business, all of those things I promise we'll get into. But for now, we'll leave you with our eight tips to get started, which are number one, Set yourself up for success financially, mentally, physically. Number two, master a marketable skill. Number three, pick your name and own it everywhere. Number four, set up your business's tax and legal logistics. Number five, find a mentor. Number six, set up all the finances, bank accounts, credit cards, savings accounts, etc. Number seven, get insurance and particularly on Bumble. <laughs> and number eight, find your first clients. So those are our eight tips for anybody who is looking to start a business. And um, we hope these were helpful. Lane Stomp, anything you guys want to add before we close out? One other thing I just wanted to mention is if you are wanting more concrete information on all of these tips, we want to make it super digestible for you and give you the actual tips and tools to put this into motion. So if you head to our show notes, there is a link that you can download a free guide of all of the tips that we've talked about on this episode, as well as some links, as well as some open-ended questions to kind of get you started. It is a worksheet and a checklist that um, we hope is super helpful for helping you take these steps and actually putting them into action. So this is in our show notes and on our website. And send us a DM if you guys have any questions about this. I personally... Um, like I'm so passionate about helping people uh, launch their business, start their business. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions, if you want to know more about anything. Um, and we hope that this really gives you the motivation and um, the confidence to take that next step. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lane. Um, everybody make sure to head to the show notes to download that guide um, and let us know if it's helpful to you. We'd love to hear what you think. And if you want to see more content like that. Before we go, I wanted to see if anybody has a content tip of the week, anything you've been reading, listening to, or have found online that has been inspiring or helpful to you. Yes. So I have something that I feel is very relevant to this episode because it is a book that I read and I was reading at the point when we gave notice to our full-time corporate jobs and took this leap. And I got so much inspiration from it. You might've heard of this. It's been around for a while. Um, it's on a lot of lists, but it's called You Are a Badass, How to Stop Doubting Your Greatness and Start Living an Awesome Life by Jen. Sincero. I think that's how you pronounce her name. Um, so if you just need the confidence booster that you can do this, I highly recommend it. I still like remember actionable takeaways that I got from that book um, and how it changed my mentality and how it really gave me the confidence that I needed. So I would definitely recommend checking that one out. Lane, I think you told me to read it back then when you were reading it and then I read it because of you. And then I was like, no, this is going to be so cliche. And then it was so good. Wait, I love that because I actually have had that book downloaded on my Kindle for years now and have never read it. I was like, eh, I'm not sure about this title. It seems a little cheesy. <laughs> so you just re-inspired me to read this book that I've already purchased. So thank you for that oh tip. Gosh. I needed to hear I that. Love that. And then if you like that one, Jen Sincero also wrote, You Are a Badass at Making Money, which I read this year and I really liked it too. So 
Oh, great author. We'll have to give that one a read too. Definitely. Awesome. Well, we're so excited for you and everybody out there listening in all of your endeavors. We don't know what they are, but we know that they're going to be fantastic. And again, as Lane mentioned, we are here as a resource to help you along the way. Don't hesitate to send us a DM at Monday through Sunday pod or shoot us an email to hello at Monday through Sunday pod.com. Uh, We want to thank you so much for tuning into this episode, whether you are a college student, an aspiring entrepreneur, a solopreneur, or a corporate girly for life. We are so glad that you spent this time with us, and we hope that you found the tips in this episode to be informative, inspiring, or at the very least, entertaining. Entrepreneurship is such a big topic, and we just barely scratched the surface. So again, let us know what you want to hear next, and we'll talk to you on the next episode. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Monday through Sunday. If you're building a career, a business, or any relationships, we know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us. With that in mind, we would be so grateful if you can spare two minutes to rate and review this podcast. Your reviews help spread the message to more people that work doesn't have to suck. By the way, if you're looking for your community, join us on Instagram and TikTok at Monday through Sunday Pod. We're all about connecting our like-minded listeners together. Let us know if there's anything you want us to talk about by sending us a DM. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.